man, Brock, you guys are back. You are back in full force, and you're about to release Time and Trauma next month in a couple weeks, February 17th on Spine Farm. It's been a hell of a tri it's been a hell of a trip and a journey for you guys the last three or four or five years. How does it feel to finally be back as a band? Uh, you know, it feels wonderful, man. I mean, to be honest, I was saying this the other day. It just feels like I really got a really good night's sleep. <laughs> nah, I, just feel, I feel really rested. I think towards the end of uh, 2010, early 2011, you know, I was the entire state of the band was fairly burnt out. You know, we were just we grinded it out for at that point. I don't know, 14, 15 years or whatever it was. Yeah, 15 years, I guess. And uh, you know, so. It was just a grind, and then, you know, we had some, some tragic events. I lost my mom, my bass player, Mickey mm -hmm. lost his mom. So, you know, just life happened. And we we're also uh, now fathers of our own children and things of that nature. So, you know, a lot of life happened. And to finally have the record finished and, and weeks away from coming out, that's a, it's a wonderful feeling, and I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the band for the uh, the dedication to to our music, you know, we could have probably hung them up a couple of years back, and I, I'm really I was thinking maybe we would, and uh, sitting here today, being as excited as I am, I'm, I'm really grateful for the way things have panned out for the band. Awesome, yeah. Listening to the record, it, you can definitely feel and sense just that emotion that's been pent up for the last four years or so. Um, yeah. <laughs> was was writing kind of a you know a cathartic, cathartic and therapeutic experience with everything? I know you especially. You know you lost you lost your mom, and I think you lost your grandma shortly before that. I mean, was it therapeutic to be able to go in and, and just write and record, and just let it all out? Yeah, no question. I mean, I think you know I've approached every record like that where it's like, okay, I've got these emotions. I want to. I want to get them off my chest. Here's the outlet. Go. And this record, you know, I mean, there's no question that the, the lyrical content is the most important for me personally that I've ever written, you know. And, and the other part of it that was a really special surprise was I didn't really realize how bad I needed my band, you know, or, or the music in general. I mean, music has always been there for me in my life like it has for many people through their ups and downs, but once I started writing about the whole process of living through a tragic event, uh, you know, it just was like, it started flowing. And um, once I finally got to the studio, I really didn't try to do anything consciously other than just get it right. right. <laughs> and I meant that, I mean that with like, just be as honest as possible, try your best vocally and, and you know, be challenged. And, uh, I was definitely challenged. So, I mean, because of the emotion of it all and, and just trying to keep it together and make it relevant for our fans and then, you know, something that I'm going to be proud of and that, you know, my mom hopefully can hear somewhere out there in the abyss, you know, it, it was proud as well. Because my mom, my mom was a huge fan of our band and went to lots of shows and, and she was tight with all the boys in the band. So mm -hmm. um, it was a heavy blow to all of us when she passed. So. Uh, it, it's it's for her. It's about her, and it's it's also about the process. You know, it's all about the fragility of life and how all of us, unfortunately, are going to have to experience it. And you know, how do you how do you rebound from it? How do you get up from it? So that was the whole thing I took away from it, and that's what I really was trying to convey through the songs. I think the album title says it all: time and trauma. I mean, it, the album title is, you know signifies everything that the band has gone through in the last. You know, a uh, couple of years, I think. Um, and was that a conscious decision to to name it that? Um, not originally, but the lyrics to "Time and Trauma" were the very first lines that I wrote for the whole record. Mm. So that kind of set the tone and kind of encompasses the entire theme of the album. I've never really had an album that was so directed towards one topic. Really, I mean, they always kind of. They're kind of similar songs, I guess, in, in the other records, but this one's really about, you know, living through, you know, trauma for a better word. But, uh, so uh, the original, actually, the original title was Lightless, uh, and I was really excited about that because I've always had these long titles, 
and I finally had like a one word title that I felt like summed it all up. But it also kind of kind of made it so doomy and just like gloomed out. So then the other guys, were, I could tell they weren't really sold on Lightless anyway. And and I don't really like title tracks to be honest. Right. Um, I've done it on a couple records, but I, you know that's my sole job is to, to write the words and come up with the melodies of the vocals and things of that nature. So I try to like make sure I'm putting in my work too. And so to do a a title track, I always kind of seemed kind of lazy to me, but. This one, it just, I mean, like I said, that song, it set the tone for the record, and it, it just kind of sums up all of it. So it, I couldn't have th- th- thought of too much better to name it. Awesome. Um, and this is the first record with Kyle on drums. Obviously, he's coming in, and uh, Thomas, uh, I've watched and read a couple interviews with you. Man, you played with Thomas for over 20 years on drums. Was it tough to a- adjust to a new drummer? Because... Drums are such an important part to the music. Um, yeah, it was difficult because Thomas, still to this day, is one of my best friends. And the thing that it was difficult just because I've been I was in the band with him before thirty six. I mean, I, I've mm-hmm. known him so long. He's such a good bro, but he was over touring. I mean, the last few years he was basically phoning it in, and he'd be the first guy to admit it. Mm-hmm. You know, so <laughs> I totally respected when he decided that he wanted to retire from music and touring and you know we've been doing this for so long that you kind of it kind of becomes your only identity you know who are you without the band i I always question those things you know and it's like i've been so known as this one thing that when it's all over like what do you do you know who are you and so i think he was kind of dealing with all that stuff and he became a he's a tremendous artist you know he's just a talented guy so he went on to do other things and he basically gave us our, his blessing to continue on with Kyle. I mean, Kyle's part of our family. We know Kyle since he was a little kid. I mean, he's he's like 10 years younger than us. So <laughs> um, he really breathed in new life to the band, which was so needed. And it probably we probably wouldn't be going without him, to be honest. I mean, when Thomas decided to hang him up, I was thinking maybe we're all going to hang him mm-hmm. up because Mickey wasn't in the band anymore and our, our bass player was our guitar tech. So he wasn't really a bass player. He was he was Steve's guitar tech for many years. So he was just basically helping us out in the live setting, and we were just trying to function, you know. And everybody was get, had all these outside things happening in their life, so it was difficult to like really focus on the band one hundred percent as we had for so many years. So I think that whole break between Collision and this record it was so needed. And you know, people get worried like, well, you need to hurry up and get a record every two years so people don't forget about you. And I get that, but I think that in our case, the break and coming back with the record that we came back with, I mean, I think it, it, the, the break is going to do a lot of good for us. I mean, people, so far, the two songs we've released have been really greeted with, you know, positivity, and I'm so grateful to our fans for being patient, for, for waiting for us. And so, you know, I think that the, the distance makes the heart go fonder scenario, I think, really fits yeah. for us right now. And and it, if anything, I think fans are just glad to have to have you back. I mean, they they wanted music for so long that it's like finally music. Yes, let's get excited about yeah. It. You know, and that makes us feel so good too. I mean, you know what I mean. I mean, literally, this is just music. You know, when you're when you're just in the in the small circle of it, you you love what you do and you love creating something with your brothers, but. When, it, when you see how it's affected other people with their friends and special memories from whatever, you know, because music is a timepiece. It always brings you back to some cool thing or whatever. So I totally get that. And so, yeah, I've been talking to, I think my, I've ramped up my social media skills quite a bit too <laughs> in the last year. So just getting to like converse with people that bleed your band. I mean, that's just a, a rad thing. It's, it's super cool. How do you feel about um, the resurgence of vinyl records? Because a lot of bands are putting the material out on vinyl now, as well as CD and um, digitally. I mean, I think it's rad. I mean, the CD obviously is kind of toast. You know, nobody really cares about the physical copy, which is a shame. Yeah. But I mean, growing up for me, you know, my parents had vinyl, and and so I I inherited that vinyl love too, and I have. You know, I, I listen to records on vinyl all the time. There's all these reissues. We put out our last two records on vinyl. The new record's going to come out on vinyl, but it's going to be a special edition later in the year. Okay. Um, so 
Yeah, man, the, the vinyl thing's killer. And hearing kids that are, you know, in high school and stuff that are, you know, carrying on that tradition and, and stuff because, let's be honest, I mean, you want to see some really cool art and some, you know, the cool lyric pages and things. Oh, yeah. It's way bigger on vinyl, so uh, it's just a cool It's a cool thing. I, it, you know, the cassette probably will never come back, and the CD will probably always be there, but it's definitely more of an iPod world. You know, every yeah. in-dash stereo has a USB hookup now, so, mm -hmm. you know, you plug your phone in and your jams are right there, which I love. That's very convenient, but, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't miss having CD cases all over the place, but I still love the, getting the CD and looking at the art and the, the lyrics. I mean, I'm from that era, mm -hmm. and so I, 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 was, I hope that the vinyl thing at least continues on for the physical aspect. I hope so. Um, and you guys, uh, next week, you head over to the UK, um, making the return to the road and the Euro, uh, the Euro trek. Um, how's it going to feel to finally get out and play some of these new songs live and some of the old material as well, especially, I mean, and what better place to kick it off than the UK? I mean, they're so metal heavy over there. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a definite reason we're going there first. You know, that country embraced us first before, uh, you know, anywhere else except the outside of our state of Alaska. So, um, the UK is like our second home. It's been said for a billion years since we started touring there in the late nineties. So, uh, it's just a special place with special fans that never wavered and only bring more each time. So, um, to kick it off there next week is, is going to be real special. Most of the shows are sold out, which I mean, you know, that, that feels amazing. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll hit the UK for two weeks and then, uh, mainland Europe for another two weeks and then, we come back, we have a couple of weeks off, and then we start a, a really great tour supporting Nonpoint, who is a, a radio rock band, really, and <laughs> we've never really got to tour with many bands like that. So to get in front of uh, those kind of fans is, is huge and important for our band at this stage and age of trying to go up the ladder, you know? Mm -hmm. who, who, who doesn't want to get have more success, you know? So right. we're going out with Nonpoint, and that's going to be great, and uh, then we go directly with Five Finger Death Punch, which they're they're in arenas, you know, so yeah. that's just an, that's an amazing opportunity for us. So more radio listeners, and I've always thought that our band had songs that should be on active rock radio, and mm -hmm. we just never really get it. So um, I don't put a lot of stock in it either way. I mean, you want to have that fan base that is organically grown and that grinds with you, and that's what we have. I mean, it's not massive, but it's, it's steady and strong, and I've always been grateful for that. But like I said, I mean, we want to step up. We want to walk up the ladder just like everybody else. So the 20th year of the band, let's uh, let's keep it rolling and get bigger and better and see see more places of the world. That's that's my total goal this year. Awesome. And Death, Death Punch and Nine Point, I think are, they're two of the heavier radio rock bands out there. I mean, they're radio rock, but they sure. Death Punch, especially when they first started, has some really heavy stuff. Um, right. But finally, I gotta ask um, the move to Spine Farm for uh, for time and trauma. Um, was it one of those things that Roadrunner, your contract was just stop and you needed a new home, or what? What led the shift over to Spine Farm? Well, we were at we were we loved Roadrunner, but they disbanded all the offices in Europe, and those are where the people that I loved worked. So the U.S. branch, we weren't with them anymore. We were actually with Ferret. Right. And uh, Universal, Universal bought Ferret, so there was no longer that. So we were, like, pretty much free agents. We could do what we wanted. We okay. could have entertained being seen how Universal liked the demos. But then the Spine Farm guys came calling, and I knew the former president of the Roadrunner uh -huh. U.S. Um, well, not just U.S., but the world, but uh, is the president of Spine Farm. So I knew him for many years, and uh, Tim Brennan was my guy at Ferret. And he's the marketing guy at Spine Farm now. So we had mutual friends there, or we had friends there. Okay. And uh, we sent them the demos, and they loved it. And, and, you know, they're trying to prove themselves in the States as well. You know, the the, the record company is European mm -hmm. mainly. Yeah. So uh, we're both fighting for something, and that's uh, growth in the States. And I just really like their pitch and their hunger. And I've done more press for this record than I have on any album, nice. which is a contribute to them. And we basically cleaned house. I mean, we got new management, we got new booking agent, we got new publicist, new label. So everybody's on the same page. Everybody's passionate about the band. At least it feels that way. And uh, so that that feels really good to have 
a really fresh new team around us. Definitely, it's like it's it's a new chapter for Thirty Six Crazy Fist. Honestly, it's a it's a new life. It's a new chapter. It's Thirty Six Crazy Fist. Four or five years later, just time to tear it up, man. It's uh, you guys. Are- no, I agree, man. I agree totally. And I, like I said before, I feel like I got a good night's sleep, and I, I really do. Like when I leave, I actually leave tomorrow to to get with the guys and, and rehearse over the weekend. I mean, they've been rehearsing. They live in Portland, so I, I'm away from them. But right. um, So I'll get with them for the weekend and uh, be ready for next Wednesday to start it off. And uh, We got a really cool set list. We're playing a lot of old songs that we haven't played off the Bitterness era yes. to, to the new songs. And so I think the set list is going to be really appealing to people because it's definitely going to be appealing to me because we're playing like six or seven songs that we haven't played in years. So I'm really nice. stoked about that. Switching it up, and uh, that's kind of the beauty with Kyle as well. He'll play anything, and you know Thomas. He didn't want to always play like certain old songs. He's like, no, I hate that song. And it would kind of dictate what we did. So now we got a little bit more lease on life with that. You know, we, the leash is a, a lot longer with Kyle. He'll play anything. And he basically does what we tell him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how it should he, be. So he's the new guy. You know, the new guy's got to take a little bit of hazy. You know what I mean? Exactly, man. Brock, thank you so much for taking time today, especially after all of the confusion and everything, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really, truly appreciate it. The new album, Time and Trauma, out via Spine Farm Records, February 17th here in the States, hitting the hitting the UK this week, March hitting the US with Nonpoint, man. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see it. Congratulations on yeah. everything. Thanks so much, bro. I really appreciate the call and the coverage and, the, and any of the the positive vibes you send our way, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. We'll catch you later. All right, take it easy, buddy. You too. See ya.